Hello everyone, my name is Buddy Stark. I manage Longway Planetarium up in Flint. Um, and I've been asked to do a video uh, that does a couple of things. One uh, is it talks a little bit about the night sky and what you can uh, hope to see in it right now and in the coming couple of months, really. It's a little bit tricky to do a star talk like this where the video is going to be up uh, for uh, quite a while uh, because some things, and we'll talk about them, uh, change rather quickly. Uh, and so it doesn't do a whole lot of good to talk about those things in a video that may be up for several weeks. Um, and other things uh, will be uh, visible for quite some time. And so those will be the things that we focus on, and we'll talk about how we find those moving into the future. The other thing that this video is going to do toward the end, I'm also going to take uh, a little tour of my facility. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, we have uh, Longway Planetarium is Michigan's largest planetarium, and we updated it about five years ago or so um, to a very modern uh, digital system as well. So there's a lot of neat sort of features. We have a really big mural uh, with some um, some hidden paintings on it, so I'll show you that. And I'll show you some of the behind the scenes uh, stuff in a planetarium that you don't normally get to see in terms of how planetariums actually work uh, and the way that we create this sort of uh, illusion of the night sky in an interior space. But before we get to that, let's talk about uh, the things that you can expect to see uh, in the sky right now and in the coming weeks. I have it set. I have, so this is Stellarium, by the way, if you're not aware. If you are interested in astronomy, uh, but don't really know where to get started, Stellarium is actually a free program that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, it's totally free. And it's a very simple, easy to use. It sort of turns your desktop into, or laptop, into a, a little mini planetarium so that you can set the time and your location, uh, and you can kind of practice looking at the sky. And so everything that I do uh, for the for the night sky portion of this is going to be in Stellarium, and you can get, get that for yourself and just kind of play around and learn constellations, learn where to expect to see planets. Uh, it's just a great tool for... Um, for teaching yourself a little bit about stargazing. Uh, so, I currently have Stellarium set for what is today, for me, <laughs> it'll be uh, in the past for you, um, but right around sunset, right? If, we, if you stepped outside uh, and faced south, that you can see that there are little cardinal points here uh, across the horizon, so we're facing south, east is over here on our left, and west is over here on our right, so you can see the sun setting over there in the west. Actually, this time of year, as we head, we are past the autumnal equinox, we are into the fall season, which means that really the sun is setting a little bit southwest now, and as we head towards winter into November and December, the sun will continue to move a little bit more and more south until we finally get to uh, the winter solstice, where it will appear to stop from our point of view and slowly work its way back due west as we head towards spring and then up into the northwest when we get to summer next year. Okay, so I have it set for sunset this evening. Uh, and if we go just a few minutes, so you can see I've got a time up here as well. Now, Stellarium does do military time, so you have to kind of, you know, convert that in your head. This is set for about 7 p.m. or so. That's just about sunset um, this evening. And if I go just a few minutes into the future, so I'm going to click this arrow to increase time just a little bit, we very quickly see Jupiter show up in the south. I've increased the text. Hopefully you can read that. That's Jupiter. The text is small in these videos, so I've made it a little bigger. Um, I don't want it to be too big. It gets in the way. But we have Jupiter uh, rising in the south, and you don't have to stay up late for this, and it doesn't have to be very dark because Jupiter is a very bright planet, and it's very easy to see. Even without a telescope, without binoculars, you can find a Jupiter with no help from equipment, as long as you know where to look. And all uh, summer and into this fall, and into the winter really as well, although it will get trickier as we head into the winter, because Jupiter will begin to set earlier and earlier. Uh, so you will want to want to check it out, and it'll get cold, right? You don't want to go out when it's too cold outside. But Jupiter uh, is a great thing to start practicing with. That planet is going to be up in the south for quite some time, easily the next several weeks and into the next coming months. Jupiter will be in the south, southwest, as we head into the winter. And shortly after that, if I go just a few more minutes, 
we also see Saturn right next to Jupiter. This has been a really great summer for uh, amateur astronomy viewing, and again, it is going to head somewhat into the fall, although it does get a little cold to set up a telescope and things uh, once we get into November, December, especially, of course, January. But if you are uh, strong of will, uh, you can still manage it. Um, so both of these, Jupiter is much brighter than Saturn. You'll be able to tell which one's which, and of course Jupiter will be on the right there. But Saturn is also very bright, much brighter than uh, any nearby stars. Uh, planets do vary in brightness depending on how far uh, we are from them, because of course both the Earth and whatever planet we are looking at are going around the Sun at different speeds. So sometimes we are opposite sides of the solar system, and they're actually quite distant, uh, and so they appear quite dim. Other times, you know, the Earth might swing around and kind of catch up and we'll be much closer to that planet. So they do vary in brightness some. Right now, Saturn is, again, reasonably bright, uh, but Jupiter is, is the much brighter of the two. Uh, and if we go, say, an hour into the future, uh, so now we're looking at something like 8.30. Now it's plenty dark, and we have uh, rising over here in the southeast and kind of over there in the east uh, is the planet Mars, which is also quite bright because, of course, we are rather close to Mars as far as planets go. Uh, and it does actually look uh, rather red in the sky. We talk about it being the red, rusty planet. Uh, and it's so red that the light that's reflected, the sunlight that's reflected from it, does actually uh, retain that red color even by the time it gets uh, here to the Earth. So you will see a red tinge on Mars if you do find it over there in the east. But let's, for now, we'll come to Mars in just a moment, but for now let's focus still on Jupiter and Saturn, because if you do have a small telescope, I'm going to go ahead and have Stellarium track Jupiter here for a moment. If you do have a small telescope, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are great beginner targets because it's not very hard to find them. Uh, they are nice and big and bright. And also, you start to resolve some details, even in the smallest of telescopes, like four-inch diameter telescopes. This is something like what you can expect uh, to see in a small backyard, like a four-inch diameter telescope. It, you won't quite see the bands, typically, in a four-inch telescope, but you will see in a perfect line. We also have a star back here. Ignore that little guy. That's unfortunate. Jupiter, of course, moves through the sky as it orbits the sun. Um, so sometimes there are stars nearby as well. But in a perfect line, you will see up to four dots uh, on either side. And those are its four largest moons. We call those the Galilean moons because 400 years ago, Galileo pointed his telescope at many things. But one of the things he pointed at was Jupiter. And he went out night after night and he actually drew the position of those four dots around the host planet Jupiter. And so this is what it would look like tonight. But if you went out tomorrow, again, tomorrow for me, uh, they would look like this. And the next night they would look like this, and then this, and then this. And so even just over the course of a week or so, you can actually sort of see that these things are very quickly changing positions. They always stick around Jupiter, but they're changing positions. Just like our moon goes all the way around the Earth in just a month, these moons go all the way around Jupiter, uh, in, some time, in some cases less than a week for the closest moons, but uh, in the further moons, about a month or so is how long it takes uh, the furthest of these four moons to go around the planet Jupiter. And so you can also, with your backyard telescope and just a, a flip book, right, you can draw and make your own little flip book seeing these things orbit Jupiter. That's basically what Galileo did 400 years ago when he was the first person to see moons besides our own. Okay, let's zoom out and let's back up again here to today. And let's check out Saturn, because Saturn is another great thing in a small telescope. Uh, you'll also see some detail. Again, with your backyard telescope, especially as you first start out, don't necessarily expect to have Hubble images, right? That's one of the things that a lot of people like, get kind of disappointed in the views that they get. Uh, it's so, it's more of an... Uh, it's, Things like Saturn is very impressive, especially your first time. But there's also the intellectual aspect of it, of knowing that you are looking at the real thing. Most of the time, when, you, when you've learned about Saturn, when you're learning about Saturn right now, it's, it's a picture, right? In this case, it's a fake picture. It's a digital picture, right? There's a, it's a very unique experience to see Saturn in a telescope and know that you're actually watching that very real planet out there in space, in real time, the moment that you're seeing it. It's just very cool. 
Uh, this right here is about what Saturn looks like in a small telescope. You can actually see those rings for yourself. It's a very neat thing. Saturn is one of the best things to point a small telescope to because those rings are so unique and so clearly defined, even in small telescopes. So this is what you can expect uh, with Saturn. Mars, the reason I started with Saturn and Jupiter is because Mars, uh, while it's interesting because of all the robots that we have sent to Mars and all of the information that we're collecting and sort of the hopes that we have for uh, learning about the past of Mars, a backyard telescope, so I'm turning to the east over here, you can see, notice that the, the title, the text there says Uranus is right here, but you can't actually see it. And that's not, a, that's not an accident. You do need a telescope to even see Uranus or Neptune because they're too far away. They're actually too dim to see without the help of a telescope. We didn't know about these planets until we had telescopes. Um, okay, but Mars in a small telescope, really, unless you're lucky and uh, the... Um, one of the poles of Mars is kind of oriented towards us. Sometimes you can see like a white cap on the top of Mars. But generally speaking, in a small telescope, Mars mostly just stays like a red dot. There's not a whole lot of new detail that you see in the backyard. So uh, Saturn and Jupiter are much better for, um, for backyard astronomy. Okay. We do still have the Milky Way in the sky. That's what this right here is. Uh, the Milky Way is really best viewed in the summer, uh, and we will be... Get rid of get rid of Mars there. Um, as we head into winter, this bright section right here, which is towards the center of the Milky Way, uh, is going to be setting earlier and earlier. Again, anything in the west, anything in the southwest, as we move into the future, will set earlier and earlier as the Earth goes around the sun. And so anything over here in the east will be rising earlier and earlier as we orbit. Uh, as we orbit the sun. But let's talk about a few things uh, that you can still pick out, because uh, again, the Milky Way, if you do go somewhere nice and dark, outside of a town, city limits, this is another thing you don't have to have a telescope for. Um, so if you get somewhere dark enough, you can actually just with your eyes see that band cutting the sky. Uh, and that is, of course, the galaxy that you live in. It consists, uh, depending on the estimate, it varies a little bit, but about 300 billion stars. I've seen as high as 400 billion, but 300 billion is a pretty typical estimate. And that's the light that you're seeing, by the way. A lot of people think that this is dust. The dust is actually the dark stuff. This dark area here, that's the dust, because it's blocking the light from those stars. The light, this sort of hazy, the, the milky part of the Milky Way, is actually the light from billions of stars that are all very distant from you, too distant to actually see individually. See, these stars here, uh, like Vega, the brightest star in the Summer Triangle, we also have Deneb here, and we have uh, Aquila, Altair is the star in Aquila uh, down here. So Deneb, Altair, uh, and Vega make up the Summer Triangle. These stars, compared to most of the stars in the Milky Way, are actually very close to us. And that's why we can see them individually. Most of the stars in our galaxy, and not just in the universe, but in our own galaxy, are too distant for you to see. They lie in this band right here. Okay. So as I mentioned, we do have the Summer Triangle still. And again, it's kind of early. It's around 8.30 or so. If you went out at 9.30, uh, because the Earth is constantly rotating, and that means that everything in the sky appears to move across our sky. But really what you're doing is you're watching your own planet turn and changing your point of view, and it makes it seem like the stars are passing overhead. So as time marches forward, everything will appear to shift towards the west there. Um, but we do still have the Summer Triangle, which is called that because it is really best viewed in the summertime. Around 10 p.m. in the summertime, it is high uh, in the south, whereas now by 10 p.m. we are starting to see it shift over there into the west. And by wintertime, it will, it will be setting uh, uh, pretty early on. But let's look over here uh, in the east, because this, again, as we head towards the future, this is really the part of the sky that's going to be coming up as we move into uh, late October and into November and beyond. Uh, and a couple of things, I want to point out just a few things that you can see, uh, again, mostly without the help of a telescope, um, because not everyone has telescopes. You might just want to step outside and see if you can find uh, the sort of naked eye things, the things you can see without any help. One thing that you can see, probably my favorite unaided eye object, uh, because it is far and away the most distant thing you can see without the help of a telescope is up in the fall. The fall is the best time to try and find the 
the Milky Way. That's the one you live in. The, the Andromeda Galaxy. Again, the individual stars that you can pick out are all within a few thousand light years away from you. We talk about stars are millions of light years away, and again, some of them are, but you can't see those, not without the help of a telescope. The stars you can see are a few thousand light years or closer to you. The, the, and I keep doing that. the Andromeda Galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. So not a few thousand, but two and a half million light years away. And you can actually see that in the sky with just your eyes. The trick is you have to know where to look. Now, there's a couple ways to find that part of the sky. Uh, the way that I have traditionally told people uh, is to find Pegasus, to use Pegasus to find the constellation of Andromeda, and then to use that to find the galaxy of Andromeda. I recently learned about a way that I think is just a whole lot easier. Someone else pointed this out to me. So we're going to do both just so that you have a couple of different metrics. We're going to start with the way I've told people for a long time, the way that I typically find the Andromeda galaxy, and then we're going to try this other easier way that I think you might, you might, uh, you might, uh, find a little bit, a little bit more useful to you. So, the great square of Pegasus, actually let me go ahead and pull up a pin here so that I can draw a little bit. Uh, the great square of Pegasus is right, oops, get your pen, buddy, it's right here. There are four, high in the east, there are four bright stars that make almost a perfect square. If I could draw straight lines, it's almost a perfect square. So I'm going to get rid of that so that you can see it uh, a little easier. We've got uh, this star here, this star down here, this one right here, and this one right here. This year, Mars uh, is kind of helping you out. It's right below the Great Square of Pegasus. Again, planets move, so don't trust that every year. But this year, Mars is trying to help you out a little bit. Uh, we The Pegasus is, of course, a flying horse. We know Pegasus from Greek mythology. His head is right here, and his front legs are like so. And so this is his body. This is how we typically draw Pegasus. Uh, one thing is you'll notice that he's uh, a bit upside down, right? This is his head right here. So he's a bit of a stunt horse. The other thing, when we draw Pegasus, we usually ignore his back legs because his back legs are actually the constellation of Andromeda. Th these stars right here, which would make excellent back legs for Pegasus, uh, are the constellation of Andromeda. So we use the great square and we find those back legs and know that that is the constellation of Andromeda. That's step one. Again, I'm going to clear that out. We found Andromeda right here. And then we take the middle two stars in Andromeda. We've got this sort of elongated A shape. We start at the brighter of the two, this star right here, and we move towards the dimmer of those two and we go about the same distance again and we find a little smudge in the sky. And that is the, is the galaxy of Andromeda. And again, you do have to be somewhere reasonably dark for this. Uh, if you live in a big town or a populated area where there's lots of like street lights and things, then your night sky, uh, because of those artificial lights, isn't actually all that dark anymore. Just go out in the country somewhere, pack a picnic, make a night of it with your family sometime, uh, and see if you can find this, because there is this faint little smudge in the sky. And again, of course, with it, if you do have a telescope, feel free to point that there as well, because you will see some more detail. There's a lot of things in the sky that actually aren't that small. We think of telescopes as needing to magnify things because they seem so small. That's often not the case. Most of the time, what a telescope does is it brightens things up for us. Uh, it takes our pupil, our very tiny pupil that only lets in light from like this kind of size, right? And it makes that pupil this big or this big, and it allows us to collect light from a much greater portion uh, of the object and then focus that down and let all that light into our pupil at once. That's one of the reasons it's so dangerous to point your telescope at the sun, because the sun is already bright enough that just the light entering your pupil by itself will damage it. And if you take all the light entering this kind of area and you focus it way down onto a point the size of your pupil, then you're letting in thousands and thousands uh, of times the brightness of the sun very, very quickly uh, can damage eyes. So never do that. Uh, but that, so you can see Andromeda here, is not a terribly small object. In fact, the Andromeda galaxy from edge to edge here, uh, from our point of view here on the Earth, is actually bigger than the moon. It's bigger across in the sky than the full moon. It doesn't need magnification at all. It needs a brightening up. That's what telescopes can help with. Okay.
The other way to find the Andromeda galaxy, and again, the easier way, I think, is to use Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is one of the circumpolar constellations, which means that it's always in the sky, uh, and it's uh, quite a bit easier to find, I think, than Pegasus. So let's talk about how we might go about finding Cassiopeia, but first, let's talk about how we might go about finding the Big Dipper. This time of year, so if you're in Michigan, uh, you are high enough north on the planet that the Big Dipper is actually always in your sky. Every single night of the year, as soon as it gets dark and until it gets light again, you can always find the Big Dipper provided, excuse me, that a cloud isn't blocking your view or there aren't trees blocking your view because this time of year, as we head into the fall and the winter, the Big Dipper does get very low on the northern horizon. The Big Dipper goes around and around the northern half of your sky, and in the summertime it's very high in the north, and in the wintertime it circles around and it gets very low in the north. So I actually have a small tree right here blocking part of my Big Dipper. Again, we're almost due north. It is currently about 11 o'clock, so let's back up here. And that actually helps because that lifts that star up above the, the tree line. Okay, so we're back to 10 o'clock. Uh, again, if you go out uh, earlier, uh, if you go out around 9 o'clock, then the Big Dipper will be just a little bit higher. You can see it right here. This is the thing that most of us, even if we don't know anything else about astronomy, uh, most of us can, can usually kind of pick out. We wander about a little while, and we can find, ah, that's the Big Dipper. I know that one, right? Uh, and that's actually a really good starting point because it points to a lot of really interesting things. Some of them are not in the sky right now, so I won't be talking about those. But one of the really important things, arguably the most important thing that the Big Dipper points to, if you can find the Big Dipper, which is seven stars, and it of course has that very conspicuous pot shape. Well, you'd cook in this thing here, you'd boil some water in that. Um, so we have the Big Dipper. Well, these two stars, and to remember which two, just remember, you're going to ignore that whole handle side. This stuff over here, that's not for you. You don't care about the handle. It's the two stars that are furthest from the handle that you really want to focus on. Let me go ahead and get that out of our way again. These two stars, these two right here, if you follow those, they will point you right at the North Star, always. And notice, first of all, I want to point out, because there's a wives' tale that gets passed around. A lot of, oh, that's not great. My star, my, my pointer, of course, does not move with Stellarium. I don't know why I thought it would. Um, okay, so we've got the North Star here, right? A lot of people believe that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, and that is a super handy way to get lost. Okay, don't think that, because things, uh, this is one of those summer triangle stars right here. This is Vega. Again, Vega is here. So now my arrow is pointing at Vega, and the North Star is here. Right? Quite a bit dimmer. In fact, all the stars in the Summer Triangle are brighter than the North Star. It's a fairly bright star, but by no means is it the brightest star in the sky. So don't look for that. Just find the Big Dipper. It'll show you where the North Star is. Now, I say all this. Well, for one, the North Star is important in and of itself because uh, as we fast forward time, watch the North Star here. I mentioned how the Earth is turning, and so it appears like everything in the sky is moving. But if I go hour by hour, Notice that the North Star really doesn't move. Everything else, and let's see, the Big Dipper is now here. Everything else appears to rotate as the Earth is rotating, but because the North Star is directly above our North Pole, everything appears to rotate around that point. That's why the North Star is important. It's not just that it's north, because sometimes the stars in the Big Dipper are due north. The problem is that you can't trust the Big Dipper to stay there. It's going to shift on you. The reason the North Star is important is because it's always north. Your entire life, no matter what time it is, if you find the North Star, you are facing north. And south is behind you, east is on your right, west is to your left. Okay, but the other reason I did this is because this is also how you go about finding Cassiopeia. Because if you find the Big Dipper, we take these two stars, we use them to find the North Star, but this time we don't stop. We just go straight through. And if you go about the same distance, so right, if I could like cut that in half, we got the Big Dipper on one side, about the same distance away, and just about opposite the Big Dipper, we have this W shape right here. And that's a constellation known as Queen Cassiopeia. It's five bright stars, also a pretty conspicuous pattern once you kind of get used to finding that uh, in the sky. This is Cassiopeia right here. It's another one of the rather 
easy constellations to find, and it's also always in your sky, because if it's close enough to the North Star, uh, it doesn't have to set, it just goes around and around. That's true of the Big Dipper, and it's true of Cassiopeia as well. And uh, so the someone just pointed out to me, just like a month ago, we were at a, an astronomy event, and someone pointed out to me that if you take this part of Cassiopeia, the wider of the two uh, or the like more right angle of the two V's, uh, and you bisect that little triangle that you just made, it also points you right to Andromeda. Uh, so that's probably an easy, I think that's an easier way to find the Andromeda galaxy, which again is a fall thing to see uh, as we head into the coming months. Uh, the higher it gets in the sky, the better, because then you're looking through less atmosphere. Uh, but one final, or a couple final things before I move on to my, my tour of my facility. Uh, as we move into the winter, a few other very pretty things are going to begin rising into the sky. So right now they're going to be rising rather late, uh, but I do want to kind of point them out because there's a, a few really great things to see in the winter sky if you're willing to go out and freeze for a few minutes uh, while you look at the stars. One of those things is already in the sky, but again, notice that it is rather low. It's, it's not, it's, this is just one of the stars. We'll, we'll figure out how to select it here in a moment. But right about here... Um, and again, the issue is that when you, when something is low in the sky, if you think about the atmosphere on the Earth, you're kind of looking along the horizon and you're actually looking through a lot more air, which, uh, air has a tendency to bend light depending on how humid it is. It acts like a lens. Uh, but it's not a very consistent lens because the humidity changes as the light moves towards you and the temperature of the air and, you know, several miles of air, uh, changes as well. And what that does is it causes these things to sort of wobble. Uh, it's actually also what causes the twinkling of stars. It's our own atmosphere that causes this. So as that light moves towards you, it sort of wobbles, and the, the image that you get to see isn't quite so clear. Whereas if you're looking straight overhead, you do still, of course, have some atmosphere between you and space, but because you're looking kind of straight out of it, you have a lot less. And so things that are high in the sky tend to be clearer. So as the winter moves on, or as we head into winter, the this uh, what's called the Pleiades star cluster is going to get higher and higher. So the later in the year you look for this, the better, because it will be higher uh, in your sky. But the Pleiades is great because, for one, it is pretty just with your with your eyes. I thought I'd be able to select just the whole group there. I guess we won't. Okay, it's not too important. You can see it just with your eyes. You can also, this is a great target for binoculars. There's several things in the sky that you don't have to have a telescope for because binoculars are a lot more common. You can actually point binoculars at the Pleiades star cluster and you get a very pretty view, something like this. Uh, this particular star cluster is uh, extra pretty, if that's, if that's uh, I don't know, that's not a technical term, but you get the idea, because uh, it's an open cluster, which means that it's a fairly young cluster of stars that all formed out of the same cloud of gas, but this one also has the benefit that after that happened, it happened to move through a second cloud of gas, and now the light from these stars is actually passing through another nebula, another cloud of gas out there in space, and it gives it this sort of ghostly, in binoculars and telescopes, this sort of haze all around those stars and just really adds uh, to the beauty of the Pleiades star cluster. So that's a really great target that again will be better and better as the win as, as winter arrives. It is near Taurus the Bull. And the last thing that I want to talk about is that in the winter time, if I can go way late into the night right now, we have the Pleiades star cluster. As winter uh, progresses, the uh, Orion the Hunter uh, is going to begin rising into your sky. Orion is another one that a lot of us, when he is up, because unlike the Big Dipper, which is always up year-round, Orion is really only viewed sort of in late fall uh, through uh, really best viewed in winter, and then somewhat you can catch in the west over there uh, in, the, in the spring season in the early spring. Uh, so you have to pick your, you have to time it right to see Orion. Uh, his, uh, this star right here is called Betelgeuse. This is a red giant star. We have Rigel, which is a blue giant star. Orion is famous, of course, for his belt. But what I want to point out today, so we find Orion, because again, that's going to be in the east, uh, early in the fall and early in the winter. So you find Orion, uh, and we find that belt. That's kind of what helps us out. The three stars that hang off of that belt that are supposed to make up his sword, uh, are another really interesting thing. If you do have a small telescope, point that at the middle dot in that sword, because it's not just a star, although I'll be if I can't click on it. There we go. 
It's not just a star. It's also a very large nebula itself. It's called the Great Orion Nebula. And a small telescope, mostly, to my eyes, when I see it in a backyard telescope, it kind of looks green. These are composite images uh, from the Hubble telescope. So it'll look a little different than what you see right here. Uh, but it doesn't take a whole lot of resolving power to catch some details of the Orion Nebula as well. Now, this is really better... So of course, best view with the biggest telescope you can get. But this is better viewed in typically a six-inch telescope, or uh, of course, if you do, if you can get access to an eight-inch telescope, that's even better. Uh, Four-inch telescopes do struggle a little bit with things like nebulas. So as always, the bigger diameter aperture you can get, uh, the better. But six-inch telescopes are more than adequate to see some of the details uh, of the Orion Nebula in its sword. Okay, so that's going to do it for my Star Talk portion. Oh, I also, uh, you know what, one more thing I forgot. Um, we do have, uh, for the next several weeks, um, and Venus moves a little quick because it is, of course, rather close to the sun, but if you go out, if you're a morning person, if you're not really an evening person, but you wake up before sunrise, Venus is visible very bright, as, as usual. Venus is a very, very bright planet, uh, the third brightest object in the sky besides the sun and the moon, uh, and it's visible over there in the east. Now tonight, and again, well, I guess tomorrow morning, uh, for me, uh, the moon is near uh, Venus, but certainly don't expect that because our moon, as I mentioned earlier, does orbit the Earth once a month, which means that from our point of view, it appears to go all the way around the sky in just 30 days, which means that every single night, it moves quite a bit, right? Um, so by the time the 20th, Right, just, just 10 days later, I mean, the moon is nowhere in sight. So don't expect uh, the moon to always be near, near Venus. The moon is not a really great uh, sort of helper to find other things unless you are tracking it ahead of time because it does move very quickly uh, as, as time marches forward. So do be aware of that. That's going to do it for the Star Talk portion of uh, this video. Now I'm going to guide you through a little bit about my facilities and again give you sort of a behind the scenes look uh, at uh, how planetariums uh, work. Okay, so uh, this is the exterior of Longwood Planetarium. I just thought I'd show you the uh, the sign on the on the outside of the dome, but we're going to go ahead uh, and head into the lobby here. And uh, the first thing that you'll see uh, when we head into the lobby is a classroom, and they've got it decorated for Halloween and various things there. We've we've named our classroom. We use these for field trips. We also use them for um, other groups uh, that come around. Um, and we've named them after planets. So we have the Mars room and the Jupiter room and the Saturn room. These are uh, a few of the very... We've got a lot of things, of course, hung on the walls, mostly uh, images from the Great Space Observatories. Uh, Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra uh, are three uh, that are heavily featured in our planetarium. And this is our mural that's painted. You can see it's rather large. I don't know how well that'll come across uh, in videos, but there are hidden uh, little uh, sections. So Einstein, Albert Einstein, is somewhere in the frame right here. Uh, and uh, I'll zoom in. There's, I'll do this a couple more times with uh, other aspects as well, but you can see the face of Einstein there kind of hidden in the smoke. So there's a key off to the left if you ever do show up. I'm not going to show you all of them. You'll have to come back and, and see the ones that I don't show you. Um, but they're sort of hidden throughout. It's just a fun little scavenger hunt. Uh, I think right now we're looking for Marvin the Martian, uh, which would be a little trickier. Somewhere in here is also... Oh, no, I didn't do Marvin. You'll have to find him later. Uh, is also the Wizard of Oz characters uh, somewhere inside, and I'm I'm already zooming in on them. You might have spotted them uh, before I got too close. And I think the camera, when we get too close, I think my camera has trouble. Um, yeah, focusing. I have to like manually focus, but you can see the uh, silhouettes of the Wizard of Oz characters hidden in the smoke, or I should say the uh, gas of the nebula there. Uh, lots of other uh, images uh, hidden in there. We have our very first projector, which was a Spitz B optomechanical star projector hanging in the lobby as well. And you can see that ran from 1958 to 2001, so it had quite a few. There were only three of those uh, ever produced, uh, and one of the, or at least the shell of one of them. We sent the parts uh, off to one of the still, at the time, still working uh, versions of the Spitz B. They needed some spare parts. Uh, this is our meteorite corner. This is a, a temporary exhibit that we have up right now. We found a couple of years back, uh, we found parts, 
pieces of the Hamburg meteorite uh, that I'm trying to get into focus there. We sent one off to NASA, which is the thing in the little bubble there, uh, and they uh, cut it in half and analyzed it and sent us back the half that they didn't destroy. We also have lots of other meteorites uh, that are on loan from uh, various other generous folks in the community that uh, allowed us to put some of their collection uh, on display. Uh, and so we've got little plaques and things to, um, to detail what these are. And so this is going to be up uh, at least through uh, March of next year. Uh, and then we'll be giving back uh, some of the ones that are on loan to us. But now for uh, the piece de resistance for... Um, uh, for Longway Planetarium. Well, before we get into the actual theater itself, we have one of a few planetariums in the state. Uh, the one over in East Lansing has a similar uh, black light gallery. They used to do, around planetariums, they would paint in black light luminescent paint uh, nebulas and constellations and things like that. So that's what you're seeing here. Around the entire outside of our planetarium, we have um, just black light, a black light gallery of, of painting, uh, paintings of planets and nebulas and, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, a lot of uh, constellations as well. So it's just a fun little, we call it the ambulatory. It's the fun little thing to, to walk around and, and take a look at. And uh, there are some plaques. So I walk all the way around. Uh, it's a little quick, a little too quick to focus on uh, some, of the, some of the constellations. The back half is constellations, and then the front half, as you saw, initially we had some nebulas and some galaxies and things. Uh, and as we work our way around to the other front portion uh, of the planetarium, we're going to come across some black light paintings of uh, the solar system. We have the sun and uh, all of the planets in order uh, as we move out from the sun here in just a moment. We also plan, uh, if, if, if it's not Halloween by the time you're seeing this, we plan on having a little haunted house. We're going to be doing a socially distant haunted house with timed entries so that there's only a couple groups back at a time and they're separate from each other. We're going to turn this whole area into a haunted house around the back of the planetarium. This is the solar system I was mentioning. You see Jupiter and Mars there, the Earth down below, uh, and some of the closer planets as we, as we circle around. So that's a fun thing to do uh, sort of while you're waiting for the show to start. You walk around and take a look at things. We, of course, have uh, informational uh, little lit up displays about other uh, images in the, in the universe as well. Okay. So now uh, we're going to head into the theater, where, as I mentioned before, is uh, the largest planetarium in Michigan. Uh, we renovated about five years ago, uh, and we have a brand, like, we tore it down to the concrete, basically, and put every, so brand new seats. Uh, a brand new dome, actually the dome itself is now a new dome, brand new sound system, uh, acoustical panels all the way around, uh, new digital projection system, new lighting system. Uh, and so one of the things you'll notice as we are in the planetarium is that the entire dome is lit white. And one of the things I like to do is show uh, kids and school groups and things how we do that, uh, because how do you light an entire dome? And it's actually the wall below the dome has about 5,000 little LED lights that are controlled by a computer all the way around. Also notice that the dome itself is not, there's little holes all the way through it, and it's metal. You saw the rivets there. So that's what I was trying to demonstrate, the, the metal rivets uh, in the dome. And it's perforated. Like it's, it's, a lot of people think it's like a mesh material, like a, like a canvas, uh, but that wouldn't hold up well over time. So it's an aluminum uh, screen that has, it's all riveted together all the way around. And uh, it's got holes in it, and the reason it's got holes in it, this is my console area, this is where we control everything and the, and the sound mix and everything, but there's this ladder back behind in my little area too, because not a lot of people are aware of this, but planetariums, most of them, especially the large ones, actually have a behind the planetarium. The dome that you see is not the full extent of the room. That's our projector. We have two big Christie Boxer projectors, so that's the one in the rear. There's a matching one in the front. That's how we get everything on the dome itself. But you can see, so you can see through, this is behind the dome looking through back into uh, the theater and the cage that kind of holds the dome in place because we have to be able to do maintenance on the dome itself uh, as well as you can see there's a speaker hanging there it's kind of dark there's another speaker hanging in front of you there the sound needs to be able to go through uh, the actual dome itself which is why it's perforated it's why those holes are there it's so that the sound can go through and you don't have to look at and see the speakers in the room they're kind of hidden back behind everything 
Finally, uh, the brains of the operation, uh, because it is a little noisy, is actually hidden in a little separate room off to the side with a closed door. It's got its own separate air conditioning system, completely separate from the rest of the building because how much heat uh, is generated by our uh, computer systems. And so that big gargantuan thing right there is nine different computers. That's a big battery to make sure if the power goes out, we don't damage our stuff. Uh, but there are nine different computers that control the planetariums. One that controls my console area and then four for each projector. And this is our audio rack that does the microphones and show audio and various other things. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the tour uh, of the planetarium, and I hope you enjoyed the tour of the night sky as well. If you're ever in my area up in Flint, please do stop by. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific facility. We've got lots of show options. We also do the quintessential planetarium light shows, uh, which is uh, you know just good music and kind of fun uh, on the weekend evenings, even Thursday evenings. Uh, so uh, stay safe out there. Uh, do uh, look up at the night sky. It's a terrific socially distant activity, right? You don't have to you just go in your backyard. No one else needs to be around uh, and, uh, and enjoy the night sky a little bit. Hopefully I'll see you in my neck of the woods sometime. And thanks for watching.